Welcome to an Easter class. I'm sorry we can't be together in person, and we're hoping that, Shannon and I are hoping that this little slideshow will make a nice basis for a discussion that we can have by Zoom afterwards. So this class is on the last chapter of the Gospel of John, chapter 21, and that chapter begins with these words, After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and thus did he manifest himself. And it tells how Simon Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, which are James and John, and some other disciples were together, and they go out fishing. And this is the famous story where they fished all night and caught nothing, and in the morning they saw Jesus on the shore. He says, little children, do you have something to eat? And they said, no. And he said, cast the net on the right side of the ship and you shall find. And they did. And John knew right away, it is the Lord. Then Simon Peter, hearing that it was the Lord, girded on his coat, for he was naked, and cast himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in a boat, for they were not far from land, dragging the net of fishes. And then, when they came to land, Jesus says, Bring some of the fish which you have now caught. And it says that there were 153 fishes in the net, and even so the net was not ripped. Jesus says to them, Come and dine. And no one of the disciples dared ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? This is the third time now that Jesus was manifested to his disciples, being risen from the dead. So that's the background for our story that we're going to focus on today, which is the last part of this chapter. And the main theme in the whole Gospel of John, and including in this last part, is that the Lord loves us. And in this last part of the, very last part of the Gospel of John, it shows that the Lord is always providing the way for us to be saved, even to the end of the church. And this chapter is especially about the commissioning of the disciples to be fishermen and to inaugurate the new church which would be the Christian church. So here's how the literal sense goes. Then, when they had breakfasted, Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me more than these? He says to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I care for you. He says to him, Feed my lambs. He says to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? He says to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I care for you. He says to him, Shepherd my sheep. He says to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, do you care for me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you care for me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I care for you. Jesus says to him, Feed my sheep. Amen, amen, I say to you. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and walked where you desired. But when you have grown old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not desire. But this he said, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And having said this, he says to him, Follow me. But Peter, turning, sees the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also reclined on his breast at supper and said, Lord, who is the one betraying you? Seeing him, Peter says to Jesus, Lord, but what of this one? Jesus says to him, If I desire him to remain until I come, what is that to thee? You follow me. Then this word went out among the brothers, that that disciple does not die. 
And yet Jesus did not say to him that he does not die, but if I desire him to remain until I come, what is it to you? This is the disciple testifying about these things and writing these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things, whatever Jesus did, which, if they were written one by one, I suppose that not even the world itself would contain the scrolls being written. Amen. Now that we have reviewed the story, we will look at some of the teachings about the story in the Heavenly Doctrine. In general, we can say that this chapter, and actually the whole Gospel of John, has as its focus that the Lord loves us. And here at the end of John, we especially see that the Lord is always providing the way for us to be saved, even to the end of the church. This chapter is about the commissioning of the disciples to inaugurate the new church. You can see the Lord teaching them to cast the net on the right side of the ship, and then speaking to Simon Peter about feeding his lambs and sheep. We're going to look at this last part of the chapter in four parts. First, the stages of the Christian church. Second, for the Lord foretelling the end of the Christian church. Third, but the Lord promises that there will still be a remnant of charity, thus of the church, right to the end. And then fourth, until the time when the Lord makes his second coming and establishes the new church. So, <clears throat> first we'll look at some teachings about the meanings of Simon Peter's names. We read, He is called Simon, son of Jonah, when the Lord said to him, Lovest thou me? And he answered, I love thee. But um, Simon, son of Jonas, signifies faith from charity. Simon signifying hearkening and obedience. And Jonas means a dove, which signifies charity. So, Obedience from Charity, Simon, son of Jonas. But when he presently turned himself away from the Lord and was indignant because John, who signifies the good of charity, was following Jesus, then he is called Peter. Peter here signifying truth without good or faith separate from charity. Then there are some teachings about feeding the sheep. We read that those who are in the doctrine of truth from love to the Lord are to instruct those who will be of the Lord's church is meant by the Lord's asking, Lovest thou me? And afterwards, by feed my lambs and my sheep. Who should they teach? Those who are in faith from love, represented by Peter, ought to instruct those who are in the good of love to the Lord and in the good of charity toward the neighbor. Those are the sheep and the lambs. They instruct concerning good and lead to good. For all the spiritual good that a man has is gained and implanted by truths. So this was Peter and the disciples' job, to provide the truths that would lead people to a good life, Think of the Gentiles who didn't know who the Lord was, who didn't know about the life after death, who did not know about monogamous marriage. They were going to cast the net on the right side by teaching them and leading them to live a good life. And then we read about the quality of the lambs and the sheep. Who are they? It says, as charity and love are not charity and love unless they are from innocence, for this reason the Lord first asks Peter whether he loves him, that is, whether there is love in the faith. And then he says, feed my lambs, that is, those who are in innocence. And then, after the same question, he says, feed my sheep 
that is, those who are in charity. Then another passage distinguishes the two kinds of sheep. It says, lambs here denote those who are in innocence. Sheep, as first mentioned, those who are in good from good. And sheep, as last mentioned, those who are in good from truth. So we see the three heavens here with the three kinds of sheep, and we see stages of the Christian church as it declined, still in order, from love to the Lord, to love toward the neighbor, to faith, the good of faith. And then, finally, it came to an end. And so that's what's represented in the next passage, where it says about Peter's grief. Peter was asked three times to signify the full time of the church from its beginning to its end. For this is the signification of three. So when he was asked the third time, it is said that Peter was grieved. Now we come to the second part of this last ending of John, about the foretelling of the first Christian church and its end. So first we read about Peter when he was younger and when he was old. And because the third time he asked, Do you love me or do you care for me? Because this signified the end of the church. Therefore, these words of the Lord to Peter immediately follow about Peter when he was old, young and old. Peter signifies faith from charity and also faith without charity, faith from charity in the church at its beginning, and faith without charity when the church comes to its end. Thus, Peter, when he was younger, signifies the faith of the church in its beginning, and when he became old, the faith of the church coming to an end. And to gird himself and walk signifies to learn truths and live according to them. Now, we can think about the spiritual meaning of old age in general. We can see that in very old age, the natural body no longer serves, and the doctrine teaches that every church in process of time comes to the point where that church no longer serves for the connection between earth and heaven, just like our natural body eventually no longer serves that connection. But the spirit can be lifted up in old age. And even at the end of a church, no one is forced into hell. All who are willing can still be saved, as we see in this chapter too. So old age in the word has both a negative and a positive meaning. In, and we can think of Solomon in his sad old age when he left the Lord, or we can think of Simeon in his old age, getting to meet the Lord in the temple. And in relation to the church, the positive meaning would be the remnant that serves as the nucleus for the new church that is to follow, <coughs> which, which is the next topic. Meanwhile, let's look a little further at this verse, verse 18, about girding himself and walking where he wants to, this means, I say unto thee, when thou wast younger, thou girdest thyself and walkest with wherever thou desirest, signifies that the church in its beginning will be instructed in truths that are from good, and by means of them will be led by the Lord. The freedom of following the Lord, going wherever you want to go, because you want to be led by the Lord. But then in old age, when thou shalt be old, thou shalt, not, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and another shall gird thee, and lead thee where thou desirest not. Signifies that the church at its end will not know truths, but falsities that belong to faith without charity, and will be led by them. That certainly seems to be the case in our fallen culture in the West where people don't know truths anymore and they are led by falsities. Not universally by any means, but in some cases, especially among the learned. 
So the next pass part of the passage says, to gird oneself as to be clothed signifies to be instructed in truths because garments signify truths, clothing, good. Just like the teachings about conjugal love, when we follow them, enable us to, it protects our conjugal love. And to walk signifies to live according to truths. Consequently, to gird himself and walk where he desires signifies to consider freely and to see truths and do them. But to stretch forth the hand signifies not to be in such freedom. For the hands signify the power of truth from the understanding and perception of it. And to stretch forth the hand signifies not to have that power, thus not the freedom to think and to see truth. We can see how if we get into bad habits, we lose the ability we lose at least some measure of our ability to understand and perceive truths because you don't perceive truth from a state of evil but only from a state of good and so it can become a nasty cycle that goes down if we're not careful of course the Lord is always offering us a way back so then we read, and another shall gird thee and lead thee where thou wouldst not, signifies to acknowledge as truths what another, someone else, dictates, and what one does not see for oneself, as is done at this day with the religion of faith alone. We can all get into some of that, where we want to be card-carrying members of a certain group, and we hold these truths to be self-evident, just because everybody else is saying them and we're not really looking into them and seeing them for ourselves. If America is going to continue to be the kind of America it was when it was founded, each generation needs to examine the truths about its government and why it is the way it is and see them for themselves. And much more is that the case with the new church. And finally, we read in this section about Peter and John, this faith without charity is what is now meant by Peter. And therefore it is said that Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following and said of him, But what about this one? Likewise, that Peter, Jesus said to Peter, What is that to thee? The disciple following Jesus signifies the goods of life, which are good works, and that these will not perish to the end of life, is signified by the words that here follow. <coughs> now we come to the third part, about how a remnant of charity, thus a remnant of the church, will be preserved, as we just read the... the Good works will not perish to the end of life. So then we read in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Whoever wills to come after me, let him deny himself and follow me. Deny himself and follow me. It says, Evidently, to go after the Lord and to follow him is to deny himself. And, who, and to deny self is to be led not by self, but by the Lord. And he denies self who shuns and turns away from evils because they are sins. And when man turns away from evils, he is led by the Lord. For he does the Lord's commandments not from self, but from the Lord. This is to follow the Lord. So denying oneself ties in with what Jesus says here. Uh, signifying by what death he would glorify God. We allow a part of us to die so that we may glorify God. The selfish, worldly part of us needs to die in order to glorify God. Then we read, By John following the Lord was signified that they who are in the goods of charity follow the Lord and are loved by the Lord, 
neither do they draw back. They don't hesitate, they don't change their minds. While they who are in faith separate not only do not follow the Lord, but are also indignant about it, like Peter at that time. It strikes me that in some contexts at this day, we see people being indignant at the very idea of monogamous marriage, for example. Um, so then, then it explains what is meant by John in lying on the Lord's breast, and this connects it to the new church. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, signifies the new church to be established by the Lord at the end of the former church. The reason why John here names himself saying, I, John, is because by him as an apostle is signified the good of love to the Lord, and from it the good of life. Therefore, he was loved more than the other apostles, and at supper lay on the Lord's breast. And in like manner, this church which is now treated on. So this is saying that the new church is going to be like John. It's going to be in the good of love to the Lord, and from it in the good of life. And in that sense, the new church when it's fully established, will be a church that lies on the Lord's breast, that relies on Him and is close to Him. It's a beautiful picture. Then, a little more on, on who is meant by John. Because a man's works are the complex of all things of his charity and faith, and the life causes charity to be charity, and faith to be faith, how you live tells you what you really believe. Practice is what perfects your charity, is what it's saying. Therefore, the Lord loved John, represents works, more than the rest of his disciples, and he lay on his breast at supper. For by him were represented the goods or works of charity. For this reason also the Lord said to him, Follow me, and not to Peter, by whom was represented faith. Therefore faith, meaning faith separate from charity, which is Peter, said with indignation, Lord, what of this one? So now we come to the last part of the Gospel of John. This is about how um, the, the Lord is going to make his second coming and establish the new church. Meanwhile, John, charity, will remain until that time. And so, the Lord also said of John, we read, that he should remain until he came. Thus, to this day, which is the Lord's coming, the good of life is therefore now taught by the word for those who will be of his new church, which is the New Jerusalem. And of course, this doesn't just mean people in the general church. It means good people all over the world who can be part of the New Church Universal, but especially it means people who will receive the heavenly doctrine where they can be taught the good of life and practice it. So we read again about the Lord's coming until, he said, until I come. But his coming does not mean here his coming in person, but that he was then to reveal himself in the word. That he is Yehovah, the Lord of heaven and earth, and that all who will be in his new church, which is meant by the new Jerusalem, will adore him alone. This is the rock on which the new church is founded, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the one God of heaven and earth, and therefore he is Yehovah. And to this end, for this purpose, he has now opened the internal or spiritual sense of the word, in which sense the Lord is everywhere treated of. 
because he himself is the word, as he is called in the Gospel of John, therefore the revelation of himself in the word is his coming. Another beautiful teaching of the new church, that we are not to look for the Lord to come back in person, but that we're going to see him more and more clearly as we understand his word better and better. And now we read what is meant by testifying, the disciple testifying. To testify is to acknowledge in heart, because spiritual things are treated of. And no one can testify respecting spiritual things except from the heart because from no other source does he perceive that they are so. So it's interesting that in this passage, testifying, which sounds like something you do for someone else, in the spiritual sense it has to do with perceiving it in your own heart. And it's from your heart that you then testify to others. So then it says, to testify of things that have existence in the world is to bear witness from knowledge or from memory and thought because the man has so seen and heard. Like, for example, I've been to South Africa and I could tell you a few things about that. But it is otherwise with things spiritual, for these fill the whole life and constitute it. So this is interesting to think about in relation to the role of parents and teachers and friends in regard to the most important things, the teachings of the Word. We can testify to the passages that we've read, the ideas that we hold dear and that make a difference to us in our lives. But the real testimony is from the Lord Himself in the heart, hearts and minds of the people who might hear our testimony, the Lord is the one who testifies to them and opens their hearts to see the truth and how it can apply to their life. So continuing, since by the heart is signified the good of love, and this alone is what acknowledges divine truth and the divine of the Lord in his human, and since that good is signified by John, it is also said by John that he testifies to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. So also in another place, and he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he says what is true, that you may believe. So we have these four sections at the end, very end of the Gospel of John about the stages of the Christian church and the emphasis on the, that the church will be made up of lambs and sheep and sheep and then, but it will, will decline and then the Lord foretells the end of the Christian church about Peter when he's old but a remnant of charity, thus of the church, will be preserved. John will follow him until he comes. And finally, the Lord himself comes and makes his second coming and establishes the new church. So again, we can feed his lambs and feed his sheep. And we can love him.